All right, hello, welcome to week six. Uh, this is an interesting set of slides today. This is something that I'd really like to have a discussion on in class about, uh, but obviously we cannot do that. So we'll see how long it takes me to get through these slides by myself. Uh, so let's get right on into it with freedom of speech on the internet. And the internet is a different place, right? It's not, uh, it's not like a public square, it's not your house. Do the laws that have been made regarding freedom of speech still apply there? And the answer is, yeah, more or less. Uh, I guess the two main topics that I want to talk about today are, oops, let me get a mouse pointer back, are censorship and anonymity. And there is not a lot of censorship and quite a bit of anonymity allowed on the internet. So uh, examples of censorship laws that have been passed over the years uh, and struck down, things like, uh, if you make some website available and a child might get to it and the information there is not uh, deemed appropriate for that child, then uh, there was a law that's like, oh, we can go and take down that website. And those have been thrown out in court because their ideas are quite vague. And so censorship is not a huge thing, at least in our country, for the internet, which is nice. Uh, I think that's a good thing to have. No censorship. And anonymity is also generally protected, and there are arguments for and against being anonymous on the internet, uh, and we will talk about those in great detail. So uh, let's get started with censorship. So what does it mean to censor something on the internet? Like, well, there's no, there's not like a physical thing. How do we, how do we censor the internet? And the answer is, uh, usually comes in the form of search results. Uh, just taking down certain search results that we don't like or somebody doesn't like, and uh, entire websites as well. So uh, let's pick on China for a second uh, because they are uh, known to not be very welcoming to Western corporations and uh, things like that. So China has banned some places on the internet. Facebook, Wikipedia, and Google. Uh, things might have changed since I made this slide, but uh, on the whole, they like to uh, take things off of the internet. So uh, Google did have a Chinese uh, website in the in the past. They had google.cn and oops. And that is that is no more. Uh, and it followed Chinese law, which means that anything that China wanted taken off of the Google search results, google.cn complied. So anything China wanted taken down. Got taken down. So uh, you can argue, well, that's that's a horrible thing. Google, get out of China, please. Or you can argue that, yeah, some access is better than no access at all. So Google was still giving Chinese people a service, and there was a lot of things that they could still look up. But uh, anything that the, the government did not want there specifically was taken down. So there are arguments for and against Google staying there. Uh, Google eventually got out of China. They don't have the Google.cn anymore. Uh, they... Uh, are based out of Hong Kong with Google.hk, and I have not kept up to date on this, but this may or may not be a thing anymore now given the recent news about Hong Kong. Uh, so that's China. The US is doing the same thing uh, in a certain sense. We are considering banning TikTok for uh, for privacy reasons, like uh, TikTok is owned by a Chinese company, and we are not so... Uh, convinced that it's not going to do something bad with our data. Okay, so uh, on both sides, the US and uh, in other countries, there, there's people censoring both search results and websites. Okay, that's a bit more benign than shutting down the entire internet, which is possible. So some countries have shut down the internet in response to unrest because they control the infrastructure, or at least have access to it. And I think most countries do.
the worst cases are when the government owns the one company that provides internet to the entire population. That's an issue. Uh, but some cases of when, when this is uh, happening are, if you remember the 2011 Egyptian revolution, uh, so the government there went and shut down the internet since that was how the protesters were communicating and getting together, which I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of for not shutting down the internet, so I'm a bit biased here. And then in 2016, the, the, Turkish, the Turkish coup, uh, the country went and blocked Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube there. And again, people were organizing on those social media platforms. just like uh, people were doing in this country in the recent protests. So uh, it's good to not have, I think, this kind of censorship. But uh, it is a possibility that a country does have control over its infrastructure and it can shut that down the internet in a case where it wants to. So uh, just some history, I guess. All right, on to anonymity. Should people be allowed to be anonymous, I guess, anytime on the internet? There are plenty of questions that we can ask, and uh, depending on how you qualify the statement, the answer could be yes or no, uh, depending on your your beliefs. Uh, let's, let's talk about one from the highly recommended textbook. So uh, South Korea has a presidential house, and it is very close to North Korea, obviously. Those countries are not too large. So the issue is, should this house be allowed to be placed on a map? So that uh, the, like, I guess if North Korea ever decides to be like, uh, I will send a missile right here, uh, you can use Google Maps to find out the exact GPS location of this place. So South Korea for purposes of like safety, they they want the presidential house, as well as power plants, military installations, they want them hidden from maps. Okay, I should probably say that, from maps. For security purposes, because anybody with access to Google Maps can go and look up the exact coordinates of those places and see the outsides of them, okay? so. Is this a good idea? So this is, what would Kant say? What would Mill say? Well, Kant is always about, hey, should we always do this thing? So should we always put information on the internet that is somebody else's? Maybe could be the question that we ask him. And I think that the answer would be no. You do not have to, uh, you don't have to publicly give any of your information away to anybody. I think Kant would be all about privacy. Uh, whereas Mill, this is, it, it could go either way. So what is the utility of placing this palace, uh, or this house, I guess, on the internet as well as other places? Well, I guess, I mean, maybe they do tours, tours here, you want to walk around, you want to find out where it is. Uh, there, there is some utility in keeping it here so that you can see how pretty it is, uh, things like that. Should we be able to hide it, I guess, is the question. And I think, as a utilitarian, you could go either way, yes or no. You could say, yes, you should hide these things. Or, sorry, I think I've, I've asked my question backwards. Uh, Kant would say, no, you should not, like, put these things on the internet. And Mill might say, yes, you can, because maybe it's, it's helpful for some people who want to know more about these places, or who want to come and visit. And you could just as easily say no because you're trying to protect the people inside. Okay? So it, it's all about how you define utility. And I think you could ask Kant a, a valid question as well to have him say yes as well. Okay? So uh, again, these are just ways to frame topics, not ways to find a, a, de a definite answer. You can always qualify something. Uh, so that's satellite map data. Let's talk about the past. Let's talk about before the Internet age. We had the Federalist Papers, which were written by Hamilton, Madison, and Jay. Uh, you will learn a bit about them if you uh, watch Hamilton or listen to it. And they were published anonymously. 
actually. We we know they were written by these guys because of history, and I mean, they wrote. They said that they did it, but uh, a lot of the time we we're not even sure who wrote which paper. Like people have had to use computational techniques to discover, like, hey, does his writing style match his other things? Which is funny. Uh, but these were published anonymously because, for one reason, the, the authors were well known back in the day and they didn't want to have their names associated with these because they were trying to, you know, get the constitution to happen. Uh, they didn't want to be seen as biased. So they were published anonymously. And also, it was, quite a it was a custom at the time to, to publish things anonymously. Like, you shouldn't have to care who wrote this as long as the information is good. Uh, judge me on my argument, not my not my name, okay? And similarly, back in the day, uh, women were uh, looked down upon having written a book, okay? So it's hard to get that published, and a lot of them use pseudonyms, like, uh, like the Bronte sisters, for example. I, I think at least one of them, if I remember correctly, used uh, a pseudonym when, when she published her works. And uh, yeah, so, and not anonymity has been a thing back in the day, and it was genuinely accepted. It was well accepted as a practice. Accepted, and people didn't really throw a fit if things were anonymous. They didn't see that as a bad thing in in many cases. So let's talk about some things that you can find on the internet, and one of them is birth records. In California, for example, it is public data to go and like request anybody's birth certificate and there is some information on that that maybe no you don't want anyone to see uh, in California at least that is public data and there is a website that's made that's completely free that you can go to to search for that public data so let us look up uh, the one and only Phoebe Bridgers so here's the website californiabirthindex.org you can search for anybody. I mean, I'm on here. I, I was born in California. Anybody who was born in California between 1905 and 1995, I guess they just haven't updated their data since then. Uh, they got all this. It was open. Uh, you can't get authorized copies of birth certificates, but you can get informational copies, and that's what they did. So everybody on here, probably your parents if they were born in California, are on here. It's interesting. All right, so you can look up Phoebe Bridgers, and you can get information that I don't remember seeing on Wikipedia. So that's interesting, isn't it? So is this a good idea? Should should we keep this kind of stuff on the internet? And I guess the question is, should we keep this kind of stuff like available to other people, even off the internet? Because you can just write to any hospital and get somebody's birth certificate, at least in California, which is interesting. So many, many topics. I would love to have you debate this. So uh, that's the idea. Is this okay? I mean, Conter Mills, again, you could ask them and be like, hey, Cont, uh, should it be the case that we can always get information about somebody? And I think we can go back to the, the, slide, the slide about South Korea and say probably no, you, you shouldn't have to give away your, your personal information to anybody who asks. And then Mill again would be like, what's the utility? Like, I don't know. I want to know Phoebe Bridger's birthday so I can celebrate that with her. Uh, I can make her a cake and send it to her, for example. There's utility sometimes in knowing this stuff. So uh, I guess that's where I want to leave you there. And let us switch topics to a completely different thing, which I guess has some similarities, but it's called the open source movement. And you might have heard of open source software. And uh, that is exactly what I want to talk about. This is... Uh, I don't know if white or blue is going to look better on this slide. Let's let's go with blue. Open source means that the uh, the source code. This means source code. It's short for that. The source code is freely available. It's open. All right. So I guess the reason it's been released or this idea is a thing is. Uh, some people they don't trust software like you have Microsoft Office I'm running it right now uh, what if I don't trust it like I don't know what it's gonna do 
Uh, maybe it's going to steal all my personal information. I, I can't tell. It's just a binary blob of data that I don't really, I can't really analyze very easily. Like it's, I don't know, PowerPoint dot exe and who knows what's inside of this black box of this program is just a bunch of ones and zeros if I took a long time I could probably like figure out what's what's going on if it's gonna like talk to the internet and share my personal information things like that but it's really hard to analyze binary things so what if you don't trust software and also what if you don't want to pay for it I guess you have some other options but we don't need to get into those uh, you can be a supporter of open source and you already are in fact uh, Scratch which we've been learning and Python which we're about to learn these programming languages They are both open source pieces of software So they are available for free first of all That's one of the one of the tenets of open source software They're available for free and the source code for them is freely available so you can like change it you can go and look at it, make sure that uh, it's doing all the stuff you think it should do. It's like never going to connect to the internet and sell your personal information or something. Uh, so that's really nice. And you can go and build on top of it as well. So you can be like, ah, if only Scratch had this one block that I can't make by myself, but if I could modify Scratch and give this to all my students, all my friends, uh, maybe people would like that and I can put that on the internet and people would pat me on the back and say good things about me so that's open source for you you can modify scratch itself to do what you want it and you can go in and look and make sure that it's not like gonna share your information and there are all these source code licenses that you might come across like maybe it's like terms and conditions of, of source code uh, these licenses say kind of this they they usually say uh, permission is hereby granted free of charge blah 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 they usually say things like that and uh, what it means is uh, a lot of their their stipulations are if you make a change you have to keep this license you can't suddenly sell this product things like that uh, so it stays free even if you change it and uh, Sometimes you have to give back your uh, your source code freely, make that source code still freely available. Like if you make a change, you have to put that source code that you changed on the internet somewhere, something like that. And then Python as well, pretty much the same topics. And they all bounce around between licenses and there's, there's different people arguing for different ones, but yeah, this is open source software in a nutshell. You get to download it for free of course, because the source code is available. If the program itself wasn't available, you could just make it from the source code. Okay? So that is fun. Open source software, it powers the world. Uh, one of the ways that it does is if you're on any Android smartphone, for, right, uh, for example, Linux is a, uh, a kernel for an operating system. So you can think of it as an operating system at, at a high level. and it manages like all the hardware manages hardware running programs oops all your memory which i guess is hardware still etc it does a lot of stuff it is the backbone of any operating system and Android just so happens to put Linux uh, at the very bottom of its technology stack. So at the bottom you have Linux, then you have some fancy Android libraries that are written on top of that, and so on and so forth until you have a working phone. So uh, that's something that may very well be a part of your life already that you didn't know about. It's open source, completely open source, written by a nice... Uh, man from Finland his name is Linus which is fun I think that's probably why that happened and their mascot is a beautiful little penguin named Tux and yeah so any Android phone has Linux inside of it as well as pretty much every single website you're ever gonna connect to on the internet uh, 
it's very cheap, obviously. It's free to put Linux on any server, any, any web server, and who's going to go and buy a Microsoft version of the same thing if this doesn't cost you anything? And everybody, uh, at least in the computer science realm, uh, is a big fan of open source, especially Linux. If you uh, go further in your programming career, if you take CSI 40, for example, uh, we are going to introduce you to Linux and any computer science uh, curriculum that you take anywhere is always most likely going to introduce you to this. Okay, so beautiful, beautiful operating system. And uh, I guess Linux and GNU or GNU, they go hand in hand. So uh, if Linux is like the operating system's back end, GNU is the software. And there's there's like an animal, that's why I'm saying it like that. It's There's an animal called the new, which is like pronounced like that if you were to write in Spanish. But they were like, no, we're going to call it GNU with a hard G. And it stands for GNU's not Unix. And so it's a, a recursive definition of a programming or of, of a company, I guess, which is fun. So it's a project and it's just a collection of free software that, uh, for example, Linux uses to power itself. So uh, if Linux is the operating system, GNU is like all the little programs that get you running. And yes, take CSI 40 so that we can teach you this, okay? And the project was founded by this, this man, the mighty Richard Stallman. He, he is a wonderful man, and uh, he has a lot of opinions on things. So I encourage you to look them up. He has a website where he blogs about this stuff. And uh, he thinks that all programs should be free, every single one of them, and have their source code available for, for modification. So uh, that is one end of the spectrum, probably the farthest end of the, of the open source spectrum. Like Everything should be open source. Nobody should be making their money based on uh, software. OK, let us move on now to a little bit more intellectual property. Let's see how we're doing. It's probably very quick, uh, a quick lecture today, uh, because I can't let us do a discussion, sadly. So intellectual property, part two. So there are quite a few corner cases, and we've talked about this already. You can argue either way in many cases. Uh, let me just give you some more highlights from history. Uh, let's talk about fair use. This is should you be allowed to reuse copyrighted works? So you bought this, like you bought a book. Like this is the best book in the world, it's gonna help you learn programming, I bought it, and maybe it's out of print. And so I scan it, and I give you each a chapter. Is that okay? Like sh will I get sued? Will somebody come and send me to jail because of it? Uh, the US is actually quite utilitarian about reusing copyrighted works. And that is kind of surprising. Like, you wouldn't think that, but uh, it's a thing. So the rules in the US, at least, are uh, simplified greatly, are something like, you shouldn't copy too much of the work. So I can give you a chapter from this book that's out of print, uh, and especially for educational use. That's not a huge issue. Uh, but I can't really give you the whole book. Maybe you should go and look it up. Uh, in the library if you needed that much information or something. Like, I couldn't copy all of that. And you shouldn't, uh, the way that you're using this copyrighted thing, it shouldn't keep the creator from making money. So if I use this in a class, for example, obviously I doubt most of you are going to want to go and buy this book yourself, so probably the creator's not losing a whole lot of money, and especially if it's out of print, there's no way for the creator to make money anymore anyway. So uh, things like that are things you keep in mind when you're about to use reuse copyrighted works like uh, for example on YouTube if somebody's gonna play music on your YouTube video uh, hey, here's your YouTube screen I don't know you got your play button etc uh, you're allowed to play music hey. You're allowed to play a few seconds of music and nobody's going to sue you for it in your YouTube video. And I'm sure you've seen people who have done that. Uh, so that's that's essentially a 
a fair use, okay? So you're not harming somebody, you're not copying too much of the work, and you're not keeping the creator from making money. That is the, that's fair use in the United States. All right, so let's play a game. Let's play, is that piracy? And the answers might be different than what you think. I think uh, these are all things that you know about already, but uh, back in the day, at least for, a few, for one of these, it was not obvious that it was fair use, that it wasn't piracy. So recording TV shows back in the day, when uh, like everybody was still using VHS tapes, if you've heard about those before or seen them, uh, you could record TV shows. Finally, that that became a possibility for you, and TV networks were like, "No, that's a horrible idea. Those people are copy copying our stuff. We are we have copyrighted these shows. Nobody should be allowed to record them. How dare they? We are losing money." But this ended up being surprisingly ruled to be legal. Obviously, anybody who makes the shows doesn't like this, but uh, it's seen as fair use to record a TV show. And I'm sure uh, that's something that's obvious to you now because most, uh, most TV companies like give you a, a, one of those DVR things. But back in the day when this, the, when this technology first came out, this was not at all obvious and it ended up being declared legal in courts it is fair use to record TV shows. All right, how about uh, copying? And Dreamcast is a very old, uh, I guess relatively old, gaming system. Uh, so it's a console, and uh, the games were CDs. So they essentially, uh, instead of putting music on a CD, Gosh, I hope you, I know you know what a CD is. So there is a shiny CD in its little case where it's got the music. You just opened it, and uh, so what people can do is take this CD out of the case and put it into a computer with a CD drive, and suddenly you can get the information off of this. Oh no, that's horrible. Uh, and then the Dreamcast itself would be able to play a game that you burnt on just a, a second CD that you had lying around. Boop, boop. So you could put that one in there after that, and now suddenly you have the same game on both things. I'll like put it I'll put rainbow colors for both of these so that you know that they're the same thing. So you just made a copy of that game and uh, the Dreamcast had no trouble playing it. It had a good enough little laser that read the thing, for example. Uh, oh gosh, is that okay? Bum bum bum. This is actually fair use. And there are some stipulations, but you can copy a game as a backup for yourself. Okay, as long as this is a this is a backup. For the same reason that you could back up a TV show, essentially, this is allowed. As long as it's for yourself. If you own this thing, you're allowed to to duplicate it and make sure that you have a copy that's going to last. Okay, but the second you give that copy to your friend, though that becomes not legal. Okay, and I think that's pretty obvious. Now you're, you've just given something to somebody else uh, that they didn't pay for. As long as you kept the copy and you used it just as a backup, it was fine. But if you give something to your friend and they didn't buy it, now it's not legal anymore. Okay, so pretty much common sense, but these things, you wouldn't expect that. Thank you, US courts. All right, uh, reverse engineering also uh, is something you might have heard of. It's just the process of taking something apart to see how it's made. So I am totally, uh, well, well, we'll talk uh, about it in a second, but you have a game. I don't know, we can, let's talk about the, uh, the GameCube or the Wii now. So y you had a GameCube game, which is a smaller CD, <laughs> and uh, or I guess it's a DVD in a sense, but you could take that game and like look at it, see if it's okay. But uh, you can look at 
the, the binary format. But what people can do is they took the, uh, the GameCube itself. It had a little, I guess it was a slot at the top or something. I, I can't, really can't remember, sorry. Uh, but they took the GameCube itself, and it's made up of hardware, and they took it apart to see how it was made. And courts have ruled in favor ruled in favor of reverse engineering these video game consoles. So you can make a software version, uh, convert to software, hardware to software. You are allowed to make a version of a console that is made in hardware in software. And that's what a, uh, an emulator is. It's something that takes a piece of hardware and makes your computer be able to do the same thing as it. Okay, so the court, uh, the court's actually decided that uh, the purpose of uh, reverse engineering in this case is to make new games. People are like, ah, they're not selling the GameCube anymore, uh, but I want to make cool games for it still, so I want to know how it's made so I can make those games. and. Uh, the purpose was not to copy the hardware and resell knockoff versions of game cubes. Okay, so as long as your case, you had like a your pur your purpose was a pure one, uh, you are allowed to reverse engineer things. And there is a very uh, like well-known emulator for the Wii and the GameCube. Uh, it's doing a lot of cool stuff called Dolphin and I encourage you to look that up if you own some GameCube games or some Wii games. You can play them on your computer nowadays. Okay, that brings us to DRM, which stands for Digital Rights Management. And what this is, is it's just a bunch of different ways, usually software ways, that control intellectual properties use. So uh, they can be like, DRM is like a box. You can give it something like, hey, can I use this? And DRM can either say yes or no and let you use it or otherwise block you from using it. Okay? And so the idea is this keeps you from being able to copy things and reuse them. So that enables then the producer of the content to say, uh, I don't, I don't know what I was trying to say here, but they can control the, uh, the use of the entity, I guess is what I really want to say here. So if you made this, perhaps a game, you put DRM on it, uh, you can make sure that nobody's copying it. And uh, also, some video games, though, put DRM whenever the game was run. So you start up the game, the DRM loads, it checks a server somewhere on the internet, being like, hey, is this game a valid one? Was it bought by somebody? And games go, games get old and servers get shut down, uh, and then the game stops being playable when the DRM server is shut down, which is a horrible, horrible thing. Uh, this is obviously allowed, people are doing it still to this day, and that's the thing. Same for textbooks, which you might be angry about. You can't resell an online textbook. Because of DRM, maybe you, you're only allowed to read this textbook on a website, which you need to make an account for, and you can't transfer that. So, uh, fun information there, DRM. Uh, and just a few more slides and that's, that's about it. Uh, that brings us to software patents. So uh, a patent is just a way to make sure that nobody steals your things. So uh, somebody patented a tractor, uh, a certain kind of car, an engine, things like that. But recently people have been patenting software. So uh, I don't know, the way that the iOS calculator app is made perhaps is patented, and nobody else can make a calculator app that looks like that or does the same things. And I guess the question is, is this a good idea? Should people be allowed to patent things that are not tangible? 
should you patent? Intangible things. I mean, technically, software, any, any piece of software is just a really long number. A really long string of bits, right? And essentially, a software patent is somebody trying to patent a number. Is this a good idea? And obviously Richard Stallman has some strong opinions. He's like, no, dude, you're not allowed to do this. You shouldn't be doing this. This is a horrible decision. Uh, but, and especially if we were in class right now, I'd really ask you right now, what are some arguments for and against? Maybe you can uh, take a second to think about them. But uh, what do you think? Should we be allowed to patent software? Well, for, there's an argument for, and it's probably a utilitarian argument. It's like, uh, the people who make the software benefit. You get paid. Uh, their software uh, can't be stolen as easily. Oops. And so maybe that allows them to make software in the future uh, that people like and it allows them to stay in business and I guess uh, somebody like Richard Stallman would say this is a Ford argument maybe Richard would say something like gosh what would he say well you don't have a right to do these things it's it's just a, a really long number uh, it's an idea that anybody should be allowed to copy. So, I mean, who, who's to say that I can't make my little calculator app that has the number right there and the buttons and this exact orientation? Like, maybe that's a really good way to make a calculator app. And if Apple patented this, Nobody else can make one who couldn't afford an iPhone. Uh, what's, what's the whole problem? What's the big deal? So, uh, obviously software patents are a thing right now. They're, they don't look to be going away. And so it looks like the fours have it. Uh, but there are, you can come up with some arguments against it. And uh, it, it might come down to cost. Like, things like that. And so there... There have been cases where open source software has been made to copy the effects of a certain popular commercial application like Photoshop. There's a, uh, there's a version of Photoshop that is free and open source. There's, there's a program. And same for like Microsoft Office. There's a version, there's a program called LibreOffice uh, that you can go and download for free. And it looks very similar. So I guess there's there's another problem that comes up where should how do you tell like how do you know if you've infringed on somebody's patent is it is it so much as to write the infer interface that looks the same or or is there more to it so there's a bit of a gray area with software patents and I just wanted to get that gray area in your mind I guess and then finally uh, search engines at the end of the day because we are talking about intellectual property still. Search engines, they're copying quite a bit of stuff. Like, in order to show you all of your results, like you go on Google, you'd be like, hello, I want, I want this thing. And it gives you back these results. It's going to take information from each of those little pages that it would, that is linking to, right? And so it's copying those things. And thanks to fair use, it's allowed to do that, okay? It is providing a service that is useful from a utilitarian point of view. It should be okay for it, uh, for Google, for DuckDuckGo, for example, uh, to, like, take those bits of information so that you could see whether or not you should click on the link. Like, it, it was giving you the information that you were actually looking for. Uh, so that is another argument for fair use. And... I think that's where I want to stop today. 
uh, I'm going to go and write up a few things. I'm going to write up your essays page and I will be right back and uh, we'll go over it and also the midterm. Okay. Okay, I have returned. Let us start with your essay. That will be due in two weeks, assuming you're, you're watching this at the correct time. Uh, so it will be about privacy and, and encryption. I'm going to try and put you inside of this essay. So here's a prompt for you. Customs officials at airports have asked travelers to unlock their phones before they let them in the country. This is a thing. You can look it up. Uh, what do you think about this practice? Should it be always allowed, never allowed, or allowed in certain cases? Uh, explain your answer, and please talk about both sides of the argument. So even if you think it should always be allowed, uh, then you should talk about why that's a good idea over never, uh, never allowing it, and vice versa. So there's that. And please uh, cite two sources in your essay this time, and do it in at least 750 words. Uh, and then the rest of this is the same as last time, due in two weeks. I hope that's not too bad. So we are working our way towards our 6,000 word requirement. Okay, and then I want to talk about the midterm, just briefly. That will be on week eight, okay? So let me, I guess I want to go here. Now this is going to look weird because this is my instructor view of Canvas. I'll make this week six av available for you. Of course, it'll have more things in it. And then I think right after that, uh, you'll see this. I will make this midterm thing available. And it'll probably be like right here for you because I haven't made week seven available yet. But eventually it'll be below week eight, and this is where you'll take the midterm as well. But right now I have the info page, and let's talk about it. So the midterm is going to be available on Canvas between these times, October 1st and October 2nd, and you'll have two office hours in between there. It's a Thursday and a Friday on week eight, and you can start whenever you want uh, within that window. Uh, but once you click start, you have an hour and 15 minutes to take the exam. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Uh, so yes, yeah, start at like 4.15 on October 2nd at the very latest. All right, so week eight, pretty much smack dab in the middle of the semester, we will have our midterm. Uh, and the topics will be up to and including week seven, most of those things uh, from that, uh, from the lectures, uh, most of the points will go towards an essay question. So uh, maybe study harder the, the non-programming assignments, if you'd like. Uh, that's the idea, and yeah, it'll have a few fill in the blank slash short answer questions, and then I'll, I'll give you an essay question as well. And uh, yeah, it, it shouldn't be too bad. You shouldn't have to worry too much about it because it's open book and open notes. Just don't like share your answers with anybody. You don't want to feel my wrath. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say uh, for that. So I will uh, end this lecture here, and I will see you uh, in the next one where we'll talk about Python.